It's the curious details of a murder case that transfix true crime obsessives. Some have elements that are particularly violent, bloody, gruesome, and unsettling. Worse, some slain remain unsolved, meaning that the perpetrator disappeared into the night after the deed was finished. From the infamous Black Dahlia murder case to America's Jack the Ripper, from the Lady of the Dunes and Bella in the Witch Elm to the brutal yogurt shop slayings in Austin, Texas, here's a collection of mysterious, unsolved murders we can't stop talking about. She was found on July 26, 1974, lying face down on a beach towel in the dunes near Provincetown, Massachusetts. Her hands were missing and her head had been crushed, possibly with some sort of military entrenching tool. With no clear way to identify her, the victim soon became known as the Lady of the Dunes. Who she is, why she was slain, and who ended her life are all mysteries that remain unsolved to this day. He was found on July 26, 1974, lying face down on a beach towel in the dunes near Provincetown, Massachusetts. Her hands were missing, and small piles of pine needles were left in their place. Her head had been crushed and nearly nearly severed from her body, possibly with some sort of military entrenching tool. Police suggested she could have died weeks before the July 26 discovery. With no clear way to identify her, the victim soon became known as the Lady of the Dunes. Who she is, why she was slain so brutally, and who ended her life are all mysteries that remain unsolved to this day. When she was discovered, police conducted extensive searches of the surrounding dunes, combed through missing person files, and compared tire tracks found near the scene to those of countless vehicles. Yet they found nothing to explain the murder of the Lady of the Dunes. What do we know about her? Sadly, precious little. She was anywhere between 20 and 49 years of age, a more precise identification made impossible by the condition of the body. Though she had dental work, including expensive crowns done in what police called the New York style, consultations with dentists have failed to yield any clues. Some of her teeth were removed, along with both of her hands and one forearm. Her nearly severed head was cushioned on a pair of carefully folded Wrangler jeans and a blue bandana. She was laid to rest later in 1974, but has been exhumed several times in the years since. Facial reconstruction was performed in 1979, her body was exhumed in 1980 and again in 2000 for DNA testing. In 2010, her skull, which hadn't been reinterred with the rest of her body, was put through a CT scanner in order to produce more accurate facial reconstructions. In 2004, serial killer Haddon Clark confessed to the murder of the Lady of the Dunes, saying that he had evidence that the police needed buried in his grandfather's garden. Clark, however, suffers from paranoid schizophrenia, and authorities doubt the veracity of his claims to this and several other murders. Over the years, Police as well as amateur sleuths have pursued and put forth a wide variety of possible leads in the case. At one time, it was thought that the Lady of the Dunes may have been another victim of serial killer Tony Costa, but Costa was convicted of his crimes in 1970 and hanged himself in his cell in May of 1974, before the Lady was killed. Others attribute her death to notorious mobster Whitey Bulcher, who was known to have removed some of his victims' teeth but no connection between the lady and Bulger has ever been established. Other leads have also been followed, including a number of missing persons roughly matching the age and description of the Lady of the Dunes. All of these leads have ultimately been ruled out. While investigators both professional and amateur have maintained a continued interest in the slaying, the case of the Lady of the Dunes has been cold since the 1970s. In August of 2015, Joe Hill, son of the famous horror novelist Stephen King, and no slouch of a horror writer himself, came forward with a new theory. He had been reading about the case in Deborah Albier's book The Skeleton Crew, How Amateur Sleuths Are Solving America's Coldest Cases. Then he watched Jaws. At exactly 54 minutes and 2 seconds into the film, he'll notice something strange, among the crowd, on the far left side of the screen, stood a female extra dressed in jeans, a white t-shirt, and a blue bandana. She bore a striking similarity to the reconstructed images of the Lady of the Dunes. 
What if the young murder victim no one has ever been able to identify has been seen by hundreds of millions of people in a beloved summer classic and they didn't even know they were looking at her? Hill asks, in his August 2015 blog post. What if the ghost of the Lady of the Dunes haunts Jaws? What if? Jaws was filming near Martha's Vineyard, not far from Provincetown, in June of 1974, before the Lady of the Dunes met her untimely end. The film was a big deal in the area, and attracted plenty of attention. Many locals showed up for the film's large crowd scenes. It is entirely possible that the Lady of the Dunes was one of them. Extras were not tracked as carefully back then as they are today, and there is perhaps no way to know for sure who all those people were. Like so many things about the case, it provides another tantalizing mystery, rather than a tidy solution. I create fiction for a living, Hill points out in his own post, and he has later said that he initially thought that was all it was, you're telling yourself a ghost story. But the theory has stuck around, and was recently given new legs when it appeared again on the Wondery podcast Inside Jaws, which explores the history and making of the film. Whether the woman Hill spotted in that brief crowd scene in Jaws turns out to be the Lady of the Dunes, the theory has generated plenty of fresh interest in the case. And as the lead investigator for the Provincetown Police told People magazine, anything that generates interest is always good. Could the two men behind the infamous Clotter family murders have killed the Walkers as well? On December 19, 1959, the entire Walker family was brutally murdered in their home in Osprey, Florida. 24-year-old Christine Walker was raped before being shot to death, while Christine's husband Cliff, 25, and their children, 3-year-old Jimmy and 1-year-old Debbie, were all shot to death. Clues found during the investigation included a bloody cowboy boot and a fingerprint on the handle of the bathtub faucet. Despite these clues, and despite upward of 500 suspects over the years, the case could not be solved. In 2010, however, over 50 years after the crime, the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office took another crack at the Walker family murders case. Authorities acted on a lead that connected the 1959 murder of the Walker family with an earlier and much more famous crime, the slaying of the Clotter family, the very case that inspired Truman Capote's groundbreaking book, In Cold Blood. About a month before the Walker family slaying occurred, the Clotters were killed in their Holcomb, Kansas home by Perry Smith and Richard Dick Hickok. The Clotter case bore eerie similarities to the Walker case, both were quadruple homicides, with both parents and two children slaughtered, the Clutter's other children escaped the violence because they were not home at the time. After killing the Clutter family, Hickok and Smith fled to Florida in a stolen car, where they bought items from a department store in Sarasota, just a few miles away from the Walker home, on the very day that the Walkers were killed. According to the Sheriff's Department, the Walkers had been considering buying a car of the exact make and model that Hickok and Smith had stolen. This might have been how the two men gained access to the Walker home, on the pretense of selling their car. Hickok and Smith confessed to the murders of the Clutter family, for which they were hanged in April of 1965. Authorities suspected the pair of murdering the Walkers as well, but could never secure a charge after Hickok and Smith were cleared by the results of a polygraph test. Truman Capote devoted several pages of In Cold Blood to the murder of the Walkers, but ultimately, concluded that Hickok and Smith couldn't have been the killers, as they had alibis. Despite what Capote asserted at the time, subsequent investigations have since revealed holes in Hickok and Smith's alibis, and some experts have asserted that polygraph tests of the arrow were notoriously unreliable. In December of 2012, the Sarasota County Sheriff's Department requested a court order to exhume the bodies of Hickok and Smith, in order to run DNA tests in an attempt to connect them to the Walker family murders. The bodies were exhumed on December 18, 2012, but it wasn't until August of 2013 that results were officially announced. Unfortunately, the results proved inconclusive. Due to the passage of time, only partial samples could be retrieved from the bodies, and these could not be matched to samples taken from the Walker home. Despite this, many still believe that Hickok and Smith are the most likely suspects in the slaying. With Hickok and Smith long dead and now reburied, though, it's likely their connection to the Walker murders will remain strictly hypothetical.
Edgar Allan Poe's 1842 murder mystery novella The Mystery of Marie Rocher captivated audiences during its day, perhaps, because, save for the victim's name and the location of her death, the story was true. Poe explicitly borrowed details from the real-life unsolved slaying of Mary Cecilia Rogers, a young New Yorker known to many as the beautiful cigar girl who worked in a downtown tobacco shop. Her death fascinated Poe and remains a mystery to this day. Edgar Allan Poe's 1842 murder mystery novella The Mystery of Marie Roget tells the story of Marie Roget, a beautiful young Parisian woman whose body is found, battered and bruised, in the Seine River. The tale captivated audiences during its day, perhaps, because, save for the victim's name and the location of her death, the story was true. In creating his story, Poe explicitly borrowed details from the real-life slaying of Mary Cecilia Rogers, a young New Yorker known to many as the beautiful cigar girl who worked in a downtown tobacco shop. Born in 1820, Mary was the only daughter of a widowed boarding house owner. After Mary's father died when she was only 17, the young woman took a job at John Anderson's tobacco shop. She soon began earning a more than common wage, as she so easily attracted new customers into the store. Mary was so well known for her beauty, in fact, that patrons traveled to the tobacco shop solely to see the beautiful cigar girl at work behind the counter. Daniel Stashauer notes in his book, The Beautiful Cigar Girl, Mary Rogers, Edgar Allan Poe, and the invention of murder that everyone from journalists to famed writers Washington Irving and James Fenimore Cooper saw out the shop. One scribe was so moved by Mary's presence that he immortalized her in a poem. As Stashauer puts it, Mary achieved a curious form of celebrity, becoming perhaps the first woman in New York to be famous for being talked about. Then, in 1841, tragedy struck. On Sunday, July 25th, Mary told her mother and fiancé Daniel Payne that she was going to visit family in New Jersey. She would be back the next day, she said. When Mary failed to return by Monday afternoon, her mother assumed it was due to nasty weather. But when the sky darkened and Mary was nowhere to be seen, her mother grew worried. Strangely, this wasn't the first time Mary had been reported missing. Just three years before, the New York Sun reported that Mary Rogers had vanished. She reappeared a few days later, and many thought it was a publicity stunt by the newspapers to increase their readership. This time, however, it was different. On Wednesday, July 28, Mary's body was found in the Hudson River near Hoboken, New Jersey. A group of men had spotted something strange in the river, rode out to it, and dragged back what soon would be identified as Mary's battered body. The young woman's dress and hat were ripped, and she appeared to have endured a struggle. Speculation swirled about just what had transpired. Some said Mary died during a botched abortion and her body was discarded in the Hudson. Others blamed the fiancé Daniel Payne, suggesting that a heated quarrel erupted between the young lovers and ended in death. Still others contended she had been caught up in gang-related violence. With so many theories swirling, Edgar Allan Poe stepped in. Using his technique of ratiocination, a thought process guided by rational reasoning and deliberate inference, Poe wrote the mystery of Marie Roget. The novella featured Poe's legendary protagonist C. Auguste Dupin. Changing just a few key details and having Marie work in a perfumery, Poe recreated the story of Mary's murder, publicly attempting to sort through the details alongside police detectives. The author hoped to process the case through his writing, unraveling its mystery and possibly revealing the truth of Mary's fate. Many consider it to be the first true crime novel, a fictional piece of writing based on a real-life crime. Unfortunately, there was no conclusive ending to the mystery of Mary Rogers' murder, either in fiction or in the real world. Less than three months after her death, Mary's fiancé went to the place where her body had been found and committed suicide. He left a note that read, To the world, here I am on the very spot. May God forgive me for my misspent life. Then, a year later, a woman in Hoboken came forward, definitively declaring that the girl's death had been the cause of a faulty abortion. This claim, however, was never confirmed. Like Post C. Augusta Pan, investigators never cracked the case of the New York beauty's death. Mary Cecilia Rogers' demise remains unsolved to this day, yet the tale of her charmed life and tragic, mysterious end lives on. 
the chilling, unsolved murder of the Grimes sisters. Barbara and Patricia Grimes were murdered in 1956. New clues have raised hopes the killer might still be caught. Like thousands of teenage girls in those days, the Grimes sisters could not get enough of Elvis Presley. They had seen his latest hit, Love Me Tender, 14 times. On December 17, 1956 they headed to Chicago's Brighton Theater, See It Again. Barbara was 15, Patricia was 13. They left the house at 7.30 p.m. Their mother Loretta Grimes expected the girls might stay for the double feature. But when midnight arrived and her girls hadn't come home, she got worried. Two of the older Grimes siblings headed to the bus stop to wait for their sisters. By 2 a.m. it was clear something had happened. A search was quickly assembled. Dorothy Weinert, a friend of Patricia's, had also been in the theater and sat behind the sisters. Though Dorothy left after the first film, she mentioned having seen Barbara and Patricia at the concession stand, seemingly in good spirits. One of the largest citywide hunts in Chicago history followed. Police officers and regular civilians combed the streets looking for the sisters. Adjacent towns and counties got involved and offered their resources to the cause. But as the days passed, the search stalled and law enforcement grew desperate to solve the case. Then, random sightings of the missing sisters flooded media outlets. People from all walks of life claimed to have seen the girls in one state or another, from as far away as Nashville, Tennessee. This led some to believe that Barbara and Patricia had orchestrated their own disappearance and gone to Nashville to meet Elvis. This theory picked up more steam than expected, and Elvis himself took to the radio to publicly address the girls, pleading with them to return home. Police had no other leads and could only surmise that the sisters had run away. Loretta Grimes vehemently rejected the idea, maintaining that her girls would never do such a thing, and that they certainly would not have left behind the brand new AM radio they received for Christmas. After an exhausting month of loose threads and dead ends, the search stalled out. Then, on January 22, 1957, a man named Leonard Prescott spotted what he thought were two mannequins on German Church Road in Willow Springs, Illinois. He did not approach them, but instead ran home to get his wife. Together, the Prescotts inched closer and found the naked bodies of Barbara and Patricia Grimes, positioned awkwardly, with Barbara lying face down and Patricia lying face up on top of her sister. Their faces had been damaged by neighborhood animals. At 1.30 p.m., the Willow Springs Police Department learned of the discovery. They immediately deduced that the sisters had probably been on the side of the road since the snowfall two weeks prior. Flurries of suspects were apprehended, the most publicized of which was Edward Lee Bedwell. He confessed to the murders, though there was never any evidence supporting his claim, and he later recanted it. An autopsy on the girls, which could not be performed until they were thawed, revealed that the last meal they'd eaten was their dinner before leaving for the movie theater. Such findings proved that the Grimes sisters were killed within hours of going missing. Though the official cause of death was listed as murder, the only explanation offered was secondary shock due to exposure to the elements. The funeral was held on January 28, 1957 at St. Maurice Church. Loretta Grimes was inconsolable. The girls were in white clothes caskets, each topped with their respective photograph. They were laid to rest at Holy Sepulchre Catholic Cemetery. Later in life, Loretta volunteered at a nearby prison and secured a promise from the police that they would never stop looking for her daughter's killer. In 1989, at the age of 83, Loretta died without ever giving an answer. Though the disappearance and murder of the Grimes sisters went cold many years ago, author and former criminal investigator Ray Johnson may have cracked it open. Johnson claims that a similar incident, the murder of Bonnie Lee Scott, took place in Addison, Illinois about a year after the Grimes case. Bonnie Lee Scott was killed at the age of 15 and eventually discovered naked. The man responsible for the crime supposedly made a phone call to Loretta Grimes and bragged about getting away with the murders of both Scott and the Grimes sisters. Johnson asserts that information about this phone call went unpublished by the media back in the 1950s, and also that non-lethal marks on the Grimes sisters' bodies, around the abdomen, were very similar to marks found on the body of Scott. 
Lastly, Johnson claims to have spoken to a third girl who was abducted with the Grimes sisters but escaped. She was 14 years old at the time and did not come forward out of fear. Charles Leroy Melquist was convicted for the murder of Bonnie Lee Scott and sentenced to 99 years in prison. He served 11 years of his sentence before his release, and later married and had two children. Melquist was never officially implicated in the crime's killings. The case of the crime's sisters remains unsolved. However, a Facebook group administrated by Johnson, called Help Solve Chicago's Crime Sisters Murder Today has around 1,380 members.